Hello, my name is Paul Gilbert and I'm Professor of Clinical Psychology, President of the Compassion and Mind Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you to the Com Creating a Compassionate World series of interviews. And we're going to start our series with Matthew Ricard, a very famous Buddhist monk who's been working with scientists in the Dalai Lama, and he gave the opening talk at our conference in October 221. So Matthew is going to start us off, and now I pass over to that talk. Great honor for me to be able to interview and discuss with uh, my colleague, Matthew Ricard, who I met some years ago at a happiness conference, and he is a very well-known uh, Buddhist monk, uh, who's been the French translator for the Dalai Lama, uh, has been involved in a lot of international research, but what some of you might not know, he is also a very, very famous photographer. So I thought I'd just show you some of his pictures uh, before we actually start our, our particular interview. So here we go. This is the photographer, okay? So this is a very famous picture of uh, Matthews and uh, this is actually genuine. It's not, a, it's not a fake picture, this is a genuine yes, picture. Uh, yes, I was very upset when the... <laughs> A, a photo, I mean, when the exhibition, they say photo composite. For once, I had a nice photo. It's actually seven monks jumping by the sea, and they are perfectly synchronized without having tried to do so. Yes, I think it's amazing. That's, in, that's an incredible, very famous picture. But then you have some other pictures like this. Now, maybe you could explain to us what this picture is. So that's one of those famous magic moments. It was going to Mount Kailash in, Eastern, in Western Tibet which is one of the most fascinating mountains in the world with those big lakes also. And then we were, it was near sunset and uh, we are very high. We are about uh, over 12,000 feet. So the, the clouds actually and the earth meet, naturally meet. So the clouds were really beautiful. So I, I stopped, we were walk, crossing with the car and I wanted to take a photo of the, of the natural landscape. And then suddenly like a gift, those horses and the horsemen came in the middle of the photo. So that was wonderful. Fantastic, it's absolutely beautiful. So that's taken from my balcony of my hermitage in the Himalayas. And that's a monastery that is about a two, one mile, over one mile away. And it's in the morning, I was I'm drinking a cup of tea and um, in the mountains, it's about, um, you know, I have a wonderful view of 200 kilometers of the Himalayas, but this monastery is on a small hill across the valley. It's fantastic. It's absolutely beautiful. And that was in Tibet at a mountain pass where we are 15,000 feet still driving on the car. And the Shisha Pangma, which is 8,300 meters. And so it's uh, one of the you know, highest peaks in the world. And seen through a round of uh, prayer flags, which takes many good wishes and prayers with the wind to all paths, all horizons. It's fantastic, isn't it? And this again taken from the balcony of my hermitage. There's uh, this so called God rays. Usually they come around four or five in the afternoon uh, before the sunset. And it's uh, the valley which I see again from my small hermitage. So, hermitage is very small, it's three meters by three, but the landscape is boundlessly vast. Yes, it is, it is small, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yes. And that's you, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's a selfless selfie. <laughs> uh, I, I was uh, going to the base camp of Jomolari in Bhutan. This is a 21,000 feet mountain. Wow. And, and I saw that rock and I, I have thought of this idea of this image. So my fr Bhutanese friend, they were not dressed in a very colorful way. So I just put one of them and set the scene. And then we, we changed place and I, I, I told them when I go, hoo hoo. You just press the button. So I had this photo. You know, I was not enthralled by that photo. I almost didn't put it in my collection. And then somehow it went places. It was a cover of National Geographic in France. So in the beginning, I thought, well, you know, it's not a terribly good photo, but it seems to be okay. Oh, it's lovely. It's lovely. It is nice. So that was taken not in Tibet or Nepal, but in Argentina at the border, I think, with Colombia. There's a huge, wonderful, beautiful salt lake. And uh, I went out with some friends. I must confess, usually I don't do that, but I asked them to walk a little bit and not pause, but uh, be a, a, a nice uh, human 
subject in the vastness. So this is part of a project I did on wonderment. Wonderment, um, when we consider the best part of human nature, wonderment uh, for the inner light of, uh, you know, awakening and spirituality and wonderment uh, uh, about nature. And if we are in wonderment with something, uh, we want, we respect it. We don't want to destroy what, what to give us all. And then if we respect it, we care for it. And if we care for it, constructive message. Fantastic. Uh, show the beauty of nature to inspire us to protect our environment. That's wonderful. And you have a book coming out, is that right? I had a book in French called Emerveillement, which is Wonderment, but uh, it hasn't been translated so far. Okay, well, we look forward to that. Mm -hmm. um, so that is amazing. And then just a little bit on what you're also very well known for <laughs> is that uh, all of the research you contributed with the Mind Life Organization and people like uh, Richie Davidson, who has spoken at the conference too, uh, so how was this for you, doing all this research on your on your brain while you were meditating? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, yes. Yeah, so, you know, in 2000, there was a conference of the, organized by the Mind and Life Institute between the Dalai Lama and the great scientists, including Francisco Varela, Richard, Richard Davidson and others, on Paul Ekman, on destructive emotions. And so uh, that was the first time I joined the Mind and Life uh, meetings. And uh, halfway through the week, the Dalai Lama said, that's all great, our discussion, but what can we contribute to society? So we had a brainstorming, you know, those meetings last for five days. And then we decided, we told the Solines that we could start a, a serious research project because before meditation was studied a little bit in a sort of fringe way. Uh, but now the very good scientists with long-term meditators could get together so I very imprudent, imprudently raised my hand as a volunteer. Uh, I didn't know then that I would end up spending more than 100 hours in fMRI machine and be <laughs> submitted to electric shocks, heat, transmagnetic uh, um, cranial stimulation, and all kinds of stuff. I was becoming flying guinea pig. And <laughs> when they said that, you know, there was interesting thing in my brain due to mind training, I was sort of laughing because I thought, well, if they could have... Uh, tested those great, you know, hermits and meditators who spent 20 years in caves, that would have been something else. But anyway, that was wonderful. And this year we celebrated the 20, 20th anniversary of destructive emotion. And most of the people, except Francisco Varela, are still alive. Wonderful. Gather virtually for three days. Wonderful. So here I'm with Richard Davidson. Yes. And coming out, uh, you know, coming in and out of fMRI. That's fantastic. And of course, a lot of the research that Richie did and you did has led on to all of these understandings that we can train our brain. And because of neuroplasticity, this can actually change some of the connections in our brain. So that was terrific. Um, so just wanted to give a little bit of background to you, Mathieu, because you're a man of many, many talents and you made many different types of contribution. But uh, for the rest of our discussion, just let's focus on compassion. So um, can you tell us a little bit, how did you get interested in compassion? Where did it all start and what has been your journey? <laughs> well, it would be a drama if we were not interested in compassion. So uh, first I had a very wonderfully kind mother. She's 98 now and I've, now I'm trying to repay a little bit of her kindness by looking after her. Uh, so she was extremely kind, and I think it was a major factor. The Dalai Lama is, says also that his first teacher of compassion was his mother. And uh, actually, compassion has a lot to do with care, with really caring deeply for someone. Uh, but then, uh, you know, as I, when I started a scientific career, I, I did a PhD on cell genetics, so very interesting, but uh, doesn't necessarily predispose you to you know, train and study compassion. But at the same time, as I was doing my PhD, I was going back and forth to India in Darjeeling, where I met a great Tibetan master, Kangyu Rinpoche, and became his disciple. And after seven go back and forth, I decided to move there and stay there when, after completing my PhD. So I spent seven years without coming back to France or Europe. And then basically I spent the last 50 years in the Himalayas. So clearly, uh, in the Buddhist teachings, uh, compassion is the 
and loving, say, altruistic love and compassion are the main road, the royal road to uh, approaching enlightenment. Of course, enlightenment in Buddhism is the, the ultimate wisdom, ultimate no, the perfect knowledge of reality, dissolving the all distortion upon reality, like seeing things as permanent, as a solid self and everything. But he says that the, the drive, what uh, gives you the provision along the way to achieve that uh, is the store of goodness that is generated by cultivating unconditional love and compassion. Because it, it says that if you just get enlightenment for yourself, then so what, you know, basically. While if you wish to achieve, seeing the suffering of beings and seeing that you are completely unable to do much, even to help yourself. So the idea that uh, you will get the only way to really meaningfully help them is to get rid of the causes of suffering yourself. So to achieve the state of Buddhahood in order to gain the capacity to free sentient beings from suffering. So that's uh, what we call bodhicitta. So all the way, compassion is there. And I, as an interpreter of the Dalai Lama since 1989, the French interpreter, I noticed that, of course, in his Buddhist teaching, he speaks of various subjects. But over the years, you know, he has been ent almost entirely focusing, especially in the last years where he, he was traveling, on compassion. He said, what we need is a compassionate world. And he said, at the end of each talk, he says, well, I've talked about many things. If it's not interesting, use it. If not, drop it. But remember one thing, have good heart. Anyone who say that, it may sound a little bit flat, but if it comes from an immense heart, then it, it resonates differently. So I was, became convinced that altruism and compassion are the pragmatic and necessary answer to most of the challenges of our time. So that's why I became sort of a, such a, it became such an inspiration in my life, both in my personal practice and also putting it in action 20 years ago, I started with a few friends and humanitarian organization called Karuna, Sechen, which means compassion. And today we are helping more than 250,000 people in Asia, mostly India, Nepal, and Tibet. And so, yes, try to put compassion in action as well. So I think that's terrific, isn't it? That's a wonderful um, overview. And this concept about... Um, it's sort of a benevolent wish to be able to uh, address suffering, alleviate it, prevent it, and the causes of suffering. So, you know, preventing suffering is also important, not just alleviating it. And that's a benevolent wish. And I think one of the interesting things about when we talk about love, you always talk about altruistic love, because I think it's quite important to clarify what we mean by love. Because in the West, people think love means, oh, liking, and I have to like you, and I have to want to be your friend. But compassionate, altruistic love doesn't mean that. It means that you can be compassionate to all beings, all sentient beings, whether you like them or whether you don't, is irrelevant. Otherwise, I think the Dalai Lama calls it sentimental, sentimental compassion. So the ability to have this heartfelt wish to relieve suffering in all beings, that's the key, isn't it? Well, yes, you have to start gradually to ex sort of extend the circle. And that's also where, where we meet with uh, self-compassion of which you have been such a wonderful proponent and that a therapist and so forth. Because it starts with the recognition that if you go deep, deep within, somehow we rather not suffer. Yes. I mean, I know that people sometimes hate themselves as you know better than me. But there, there are many reasons why. But if they, I, I'm quite convinced that if they were for sure, they knew that, say, they would you know, realize that there is a possibility. So they, it, it will not be denied to them. There is a possibility to get out of suffering. Who would not seize that opportunity? So if we recognize that deep within, that I don't wake up in the morning thinking, may I suffer the whole day and if possible my whole life? Then we start to be concerned by that. Okay, if that's uh, something that would be really nice, even I, I don't know how to achieve it. I've been denied that all my life. I feel very bad about myself, but it would be quite nice if it could happen. 
So if you are concerned by it, then you will see you know, what should be done and what should be avoided to achieve that. So you become sort of concerned with the way of acting, thinking, and so forth. So basically, compassion is starting with that, with that realization that suffering is, could teach us something. Suffering could be a catalyst to change. But in itself, no, it's not desirable. You, if it's there, you can use it. But you don't want it this if it's not there. So then, then compassion widen the circle from yourself to others, and then to increase the, the, the circular to many others. You just have to, you know, it's not doesn't take rocket science to transport yourself into someone else's mind and say maybe if that person is deluded, maybe it's not a very nice person, but deep within that person would prefer also not to suffer. So I can be concerned by that. And I can act in what we call ethical way. That means in a way that will uh, increase that person's well-being, address the causes of that person's suffering. So why is different from liking or even from moral judgment? Well, it's very easy to think love, compassion, tenderness, good wishes for people who are very close to us, uh, uh, whatever, whether they are relative or children or, or companion or spouse or parents or good friends or people who treat us well. But it's more challenging for strangers and people who may have mistreated us. Uh, of course, you don't like them and they are not likable. You know, a, a bloody dictator is not a likable person. But that person is a cause of suffering for himself, for others. A big cause of suffering in case of a dictator. So if the idea is compassion addresses all the cause of suffering, wherever they are, whatever shape they take, uh, then th the point is to remedy, to remove the cause of suffering. So in that case, you would look at those obnoxious persons like a, a, a skillful physician who would look at a dangerously mad person. So maybe at the beginning sort of tranquilize that person but the next question will be, can I cure that person? Can I do anything to make that patient change and cure? And so that the hatred ceases to be in that person's mind. So that wish made the hatred, the indifference, the cruelty, the meanness, the whatever, the greed that is in that dictator or so that, that mean person which I, I confronted with, may that disappear from that person's mind. That wish is good for everyone, including the perpetrator. And it's not, you know, demeaning the victims. It's simply to want that as much as possible suffering could be alleviated and that you are ready to do that. So extending the circle is very important, but it's always the same principle. We want to remedy to the causes of the suffering and its cause because the symptoms is not enough. Yes, I think that's wonderful because, you know, because we have these words like love and all that in the West, but what you're providing us, what you're clarifying is it's this deep wish to engage in the roots of suffering because the roots of suffering are the causes of harmfulness. We often say, you know, hurt people, hurt people. So when we're working with people in prisons, for example, they've all had difficult lives and so forth. So this idea that we seek to root out the causes of their suffering because their suffering is part of the reason that they become destructive and you know hurtful so i think that's such an important you know the way you put it is so it's such an important way of putting that and um the other thing i suppose is that when you really think about i wish to be free of suffering depression or whatever when you really focus on that wish then that can open a hope it's that hope that it could be possible, that it's making that transition. Because people can say, yes, I don't want to be depressed, but I have no hope that I can get out of it. And compassion offers you a, a hope, I think. Yes, I'm suffering, and there is a path out of it. I think we have been uh, talking, my dear Paul, together about this subject. And one thing, one image that came in our discussion, I, I, if I remember correctly, is that when you feel you are at the, the bottom of the pit, say, kind of so hopeless and you look up and the light is too far and you don't see how to get out and all that. So, you know, it's kind of desperate. Happiness is not for me. You know, I'm, I'm bad anyway. It's hopeless. Nobody likes me. They are all mean and so forth. So the whole world rises as an enemy. Of course, 
it may there's a lot of uh, trauma and difficulties and hardship that went through your life and the way you were treated probably but still you know it seems that the, it's a hopeless world so now the idea that nothing is engraved in stone that even though wouldn't it be nice if there was somehow a way out who knows you know if if it happened would i take it hmm. yes maybe if it was really something that makes sense and is that possible well you know nothing is grave in stone we can change you know the brain can change we can change our outlook and some people change sometimes quite dramatically the way they see the world so the possibility is there because it's not something that was imposed by some exterior forces it's of course it has been building up in my own mind for a while and due to circumstances and tragedies and so forth but by nature things change even the sky is overcast for months and months the sun can shine suddenly through the clouds so that kind of frame of mind is a little bit like you look at the pit the pit the deep pit in the bottom of which you are and suddenly you see that there is a little edge on which you could put a feet and then there's another edge up there so it gives you this idea that maybe there are a few steps that could take could take you out of the pit and so that suddenly gives you a sense of direction, some kind of motivation that can build up. And if it's comforted by someone who's helping, like a therapist or some kind of insight from life that you get, and suddenly, you know, things can quite dramatically change. I mean, it depends on people. Some may be very gradual, but I've read stories of people who suddenly saw the world in a different light. And that's amazing when they discover beauty, hope, sort of love, you know, in themselves and others. So that's really wonderful. And love, as you said, is could be misunderstood from the Buddhist perspective. It's just the, the mirror image of, of compassion when it's not focused on suffering, but more widely on all sentient beings in general. It is the wish may define happiness or fulfillment or sort of blossoming or thriving and the causes of happiness. So basically, compassion is what love becomes when it encounters suffering. Yeah, fascinating. It's fascinating. I remember one of your analogies uh, when it went to one of your workshops and meditations. Uh, you say, you know, your mind is like a garden, okay, and it will grow. Um, uh, but if you don't cultivate it, you may not like the way it turns out. And this concept of cultivation, I think, is such an important process because of course a lot of people don't understand that they can cultivate the mind they just live according to whatever happens around them and they don't actually know that they can practice certain kinds of ways of cultivating the mind like mindfulness and compassion so i think that's a that's a really important concept isn't it? this idea of cultivating the mind cultivating the mind yes in a way it's surprising for many reasons some people tell you you know I've already enough trouble in my life. And on top of that, life is teaching me so many things and I even can cope with that. So to impose my, on myself another kind of discipline or meditation, you know, this is just give me a break, basically. <laughs> yes. But, you know, if you think about it, it's so surprising that we think that uh, we may hope for being a more optimal way of being. Say, and of course, to have self-compassion and compassion for others. It's not an extraordinary way of being. It's an optimal way of being. It's not some not something supernatural, or you know, you don't need to be an Olympic champion. But it's a, it's a wonderful and desirable thing. So, why should it be ready-made from the from the beginning? If you look at our life, we were not born knowing how to read and write, play music, play sports. Uh, all kinds of skills that education, of course, some kids resent having to go to many, many years of education. But basically, they know deep within that it's good. And then we go to professional training. Then if we have a musician and all that, we, we train a lot. And nobody say, OK, training is terrible. We, everything should come effortlessly. This is just stupid, all that training. Then what? Nobody, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense. What amazes me is that we, we some thing that you know some of the most important and basic quality, such as uh, you know emotional balance, 
inner freedom, uh, inner strength, compassion, altruistic love would come sort of just like that or, you know, take it up, you know, this is how I am. So there's nothing I can do. I have to love my shadows at, as well as my light, uh, you know, but why? Why should that be the first, the only thing that doesn't change? And then um, why should it be at the top right from the start? It doesn't make sense. So we all have a potential and we may start quite, um, you know, with some challenge, but still we start somewhere and not 100% uh, without uh, something of kindness, something of compassion. So that means that any place where we start, there's a huge margin that comes with mind training, with training the mind, with cultivating those qualities. And sometimes we do feel unconditional love for a child, for some anyone that comes in the field of our attention, but it doesn't last. After one minute, you know, we move to something else. So what, what would happen if we were cultivating that voluntarily for 10, 20 minutes, one hour, you know, and then when it declines, you revive it. When it's distracted, you come back to it, which is basically the process of mind training or meditation. So basically, if you do that regularly, day after day, you will change. And the, what you are alluded to the research in neuroscience, precisely because the brain is plastic and change when it's exposed to uh, new habits, new training, new experiences, after one month, you can see in the brain, the, the functional and the structural change even. And that's what they saw even more with meditators who had done 10 to 50,000 hours. They saw major changes which come from training. There's, there's not that they are special or they are born with something unique. Not at all. Because they, those meditators that they were studied by Rishi Davidson and others, some of them were Bhutanese peasants who become meditators. Some of them was a British doctor. Some, there was a, a woman who was a, a carpenter. So there are all kinds of people from all walks of life, West and East, monks and lay people. The only thing they had in common is the, they went through some prolonged training. But the good news is that was good to start with the experienced meditators. But now there are many studies showing that even after four weeks of compassion training, you can already see change. So no matter what, change is happening. So that's very encouraging because uh, we have all the potential for change. And uh, we don't have, again, to become all Olympic champions of compassion, but we have a huge margin of change. And it's, it's very, very, it's one of the most wonderful adventure in life is to cultivate compassion and altruistic love. It's a win-win situation. You know, you are become good to others, which is great. And also there's some element of wonderful sense of uh, flourishing when your mind is filled with compassion rather than you know resentment and all those negative emotions. That's yes, uh, yes, that's terrific, isn't it? Uh, be, and also it gives you a sense of meaning and purpose, uh, and the ability to to be able to be helpful to others can be very uplifting. Now, now another analogy that you use, which I use, <laughs> borrowed it from you, is your mind is like water. It can contain a poison or a medicine, but yes. it is neither of those things. And part of mind training is also about understanding not to fuse with all this other stuff that goes on inside of us, you know, our passions and our wishes and how to become mindful. And part of compassion is allowing yourself to slightly detach from all of that going on, not to see you as a poisonous person or a medical person or a loving person, but to actually just to be aware of all of the stuff that happens in our minds because we're biologically created beings. You know, we've got all this stuff, these desires and emotions and anger and anxiety, they're all built into us. But by becoming mindful with a compassion orientation, we can actually work with the programs in our minds. And I think your analogy of, you know, your mind, you, 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 is, you can carry a poison or a medicine, but you're not any of that. It's such an important concept, isn't it, to see that actually your mind is pure. Your mind is just an awareness of existing. Well, it's, uh, there's a two, two aspects to the analogy. One is uh, precisely that uh, it's not intrinsic. I mean, it's not something that is so deeply built in your mind. The other one is that uh, the change is possible. Uh, for instance, uh, 
you know, if if you have pure, hundred percent pure cyanide, okay, that's uh, toxic no matter what. But if you put cyanide in water, and you know, basically H two O doesn't change, is the cyanide that is diluted momentarily in water that makes it poisonous. If you distill the water or neutralize the cyanide or filter it, whatever you might do, you get H2O. It didn't get improved by itself. It's just what it is. H2O is uh, by nature is what it is. Now, if you put medicinal plant, then H2O, that H2O with the medicinal plant will be curative. So that means, so the question is, is the mind like that? Or it's just a, a fancy image? Well, if you, the, introspectively, uh, even we are full of anger, say, if you look, the, the deeper you look in the mind, at some point, what you come is not to anger or to hate or to obsession or to craving or to uh, pride or jealousy. The deeper you go, the more close you come to something that we could call the primary knowing nature of consciousness. I mean, that we call it the luminous aspect in the sense that it, it, it throws lights on all phenomena that we perceive on our own inner life. It's the faculty to know. The basic nature of consciousness is just to know. It's, we could call it the fundamental aspect of consciousness, the cognitive faculty. So knowing itself is not qualified, but what it knows. It's like a light, a torch light. If you uh, la have a beam of light on a heap of garbage, it doesn't become dirty. If you heap of light on a heap of gold, it doesn't become expensive. Light just reveal it. It's not modified by what it lights up. If you understand that to be the fundamental nature of night, that we could call it in, in Buddhist practice, we call it pure awareness, you know, completely devoid of mental construct. This is the space. Of, no, of knowing within which all the mental construct, reasoning, memories, anticipation, emotion arises, like a, a big immaculate sky, very clear, very luminous, and then lots of clouds and birds and so forth. So once you catch up with this idea that this is not just an image, but this is truly the way the mind works, you say, okay, now I can change the landscape. I can get rid of the clouds. Uh, you know, I can let the bird who come pass and then they pass through the sky without leaving trace, all kinds of things. So there's the possibility of hope, whether it's the image of the sky or image of H2O as pure water that is not intrinsically changed by the poison or the medicine. That gives us a, a realize the possibility of change. And when the possibility of change is there, and in Buddhism is the third noble truth, change can be, uh, suffering can be, can be eradicated. Otherwise, as the Dalai Lama said, take a good bee and go to the beach. Don't worry about suffering because you will suffer twice. Suffering plus the suffering of suffering. But yeah. if it can be eradicated, then yeah. it's like you have a sickness and you don't want to see the doctor and take the treatment. So that's not very wise. Yes, that's fantastic. So that's wonderful. So um, what have been the highlights for you over your really esteemed life? What's, you know, you've, you've had quite a journey into so many areas. What would you see as the highlights for you? Of course, the, for me, it was very, very personal. But the highlight of my life was to have met my great teacher that gave meaning to all the rest of my life. I was 21. And fortunately, although I've been very lazy and probably distracted and all that, but at least I met them early enough that they could give me a sense of direction and that uh, I basically sort of retired from so-called active life, although I, I, I can't remember taking holidays since then, but uh, at when I was 26. So it really gave me, it completely sort of, you know, give some meaning and direction to my life. That's what is by far the greatest I highlight. Then I discover also the depth of the Buddhist teachings. And within that, of course, the union of, so of understanding reality, we said the, the emptiness of intrinsic existence and compassion, which are like the two bird, the two wings of a bird. And you know, when you have two wings, you don't say, okay, I will cultivate, I will strengthen one wing first and, and then the other, or I'll start to fly with the right wing and later I'll fly with the left wing. 
So you need wisdom yeah. and compassion yeah. together. Yeah. Compassion without wisdom can be blind. And wisdom with, without compassion is sterile. So you need both wisdom and compassion. Yeah, terrific. That's wonderful. And a couple more questions, and then I must let you go and get on with your afternoon. Um, what are your greatest hopes for the future in terms of bringing compassion into the world? <clears throat> well, you know, I was so passionate that I was, uh, again, careless enough to write a book that is much too big. You know, it, <laughs> Altruism. <laughs> because I got carried away. I could call altruism. And I got carried away. I just wanted to show that true altruism exists with the science and with the, some, some of Buddhism a little bit. But then I realized there are contrary forces, you know, hyper-individualism, narcissism, psychopath, genocide. So you have to address those. And then while well, you have black and white, or let's say the dark and shadows, and though, is there no solution? So then education, environment, uh, you know, caring economics and all that. So I got carried away by five years of research, but I think that was really important. So basically it came, gave me the idea, I mean, with many, many people, because it's just me coming down from my hermitage, who cares? But many people like you and many others in many fields are coming together to say that compassion and altruism are not a luxury. It is actually the most pragmatic answer to the challenges of our times. And if we want to make it very brief, one of the challenges is to reconcile the needs for short, mid and long terms. You know, a mother in Africa needs to feed their kids tomorrow. She cannot think about the environment over many, many years or you know, anything else. Or investors will only look at the return at the end of the month short term and then there is the midterm the quality of life how you thrive in your life in a career in a family a generation a lifetime and that you need the aspiration to try and to avoid suffering the quality of every moment that passes by and sense of meaning throughout your life so that's the midterm now there's a new challenge because twelve thousand years ago we were five million human beings approximately now we are seven billion so we have an immense power to change the the, how the planet looks and biodiversity and we know where we are seems to be heading now which is pretty a huge uh, emergency climate emergency and so forth mm -hmm. so basically now the fate of future generation is in our hands and there's they will say you knew it you did nothing so now if you want to scientists uh, environment scientists politicians and social workers and people who are, care about the day-to-day -day life, to sit together and see how can we build a better world. Selfishness will not do the job because everyone will pursue short-term interest. Now, the only one concept that works is compassion and altruistic altruism. Because if you have more consideration for others, in the short term, we will take care of poverty in the midst of plenty. You will remedy social injustice. You will feed those who are hungry and so forth. In the midterm, you will ensure conditions for people to thrive and to cooperate. And in the long term, this is the ultimate challenge to altruism is to care genuinely for future generations. So that it becomes, you know, compassion becomes a very pragmatic and the only unifying concept to address the 21st century challenges. So it's not just like a goody feeling, bit a a utopian, it's the absolute need, the voice of care, the voice of reason, and, uh, you know, doesn't suffice. So that's what we need. Yes, I think that's just uh, it's, it's such an important thing, isn't it? Because as you were saying, you know, in our model, as you know, compassion involves both courage, the courage to engage with things that are difficult, people that are difficult, situations that might be problematic, like some of our medical staff and, you know, around the world, medical staff have, given their lives to help people with COVID. So we, we, people ha do have a courageous capacity, but we need to use that courage and wisdom now to begin to address social conflict because all of the problems that we have in the world are really linked to social conflict, people wanting to get more than others or uh, hurt others or whatever it is. But it's all to do with conflict rather than cooperation and caring. So I think what's it, very important with the contributions you've made through science and your work and writings is that you know we bring compassion as a wise courage to address 
this these issues of conflict and recognizing that compassion for others is one of the most important ways in which we resolve conflict because it dissolves conflict so you know bringing compassion in, into our schools teaching compassion and mindfulness in the schools now opening up these understandings that life particularly in the west isn't just about competing and being better and having more and being richer our values as humans really is about how we get work together that has to be the future how do we work together how do we care for each other how do we support each other and how do we soften down social conflicts the last uh... A remark on what you said about the link between compassion and courage. You see that, um, of course, there's another subject, and you might discuss that with our dear friend, common friend Tanya Singer, yeah. who's one of the world specialists on empathy. Uh, because very often we see you, so it's, 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 it's oriented towards this, yourself. So the more suffering you resonate with, it's more like a burden that keeps on increasing, and then you get this exhaustion and burnout. So what we found with the research with Tanya is that compassion is different. It's, a, it, it's active in different areas of the brain and it's others oriented. It's a very constructive state of mind and it can really increase your courage. Uh, so that means loving kindness and compassion. Uh, there's no compassion fatigue, there's an empathy fatigue. And compassion actually replenishes your strength to help others because it's a very warm, open, loving sort of feeling that goes to what other. And there's no reason why that should get exhausted. What if there's the burden of feeling more and more and more and more the suffering of others, and that's all you have as a resource, you collapse. So that's a very important distinction. And that's why compassion goes hand to hand with courage. And the Bodhisattva, uh, if you look at the Tibetan word, Shansu Sempa, is the heroic mind it's a very courageous state of mind and never get discouraged a heroic state of mind i think that's wonderful uh mathieu thank you so much for giving up your time to talking to us for our conference it's been an absolute delight to talk to you again and we'll catch up some other time as well so yes. thank you so much and it's always a wonderful honor and immense pleasure paul to be with you and see your smiling, compassionate face. <laughs> take care take of yourself care. and take care of others as you do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye-bye.